जय गोपी चन्ना बला गिरी बरदारे जय गोपी चन्ना बला गिरी बरदारे यशोर नंदनाजन यशोर नंदनाजन यमुना चीरा यमुना चीरा राधमाधा कुंज बिहारधमाधा कुंज बिहारे जय गोपी चन्ना दारे जय गोपी चन्ना बल्लाधारे यशोर नंदना यशोर नंदना यमुना यमुना जय राधमाधा कुंज बिहारी जय राधा जय गोपी चन्ना बल्ला गिरी बरधारे जय गोपी जना बल्लभ गिरी बरधारे यशोर नंदना ब्रज जनरंजना यशोर नंदना ब्रज जनरंजना यमुना चीरा बना यमुना चीरा बना यमुना चीरा बना जय राधमाधा कुंज बिहारे जय राधमाधा कुंज बिहारे जय गोपी चन्ना बल्लभ गिरि बरधारी यशोर नंदना ब्रज जनरंजना यशोर नंदना ब्रज जनरंजना यमुना चीरा बना यमुना चीरा बना जय राधमाधा कुंज बिहारे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 
राम राम हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे जय राधा मदन मोहन राधा मदन मोहन राधे जय सीता जय लक्ष्मण हनुमान जय सीता जय लक्ष्मण हनुमान शिशि गोरानीता शिशि गोरानीता शिशि गोरानीता शिशि गोरानीता प्रभु 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 जय प्रभु जय जय प्रभु 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 जय प्रभु ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಿಗೋರಭಕ್ತಿಂದಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗೋಗೋಪಿನಾಶ್ ಶ್ಯಾಮ ಕುಂದ ರಾಧಕುಂದ ಗಿರಿ ಗೋವರ್ಧನ ಕೀ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಬೃಂದಾವನ್ ಮಥುರ್ ಧಾಮ ಕೀ ಜೈ ನವದೀಪ್ ಮಹಪುರ್ ಧಾಮ ಕೀ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಚಸಿದೇವಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ದೇವಿ ಕೀ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಹರಿನಾಮ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನ ಕೀ ಜೈ ಅಗ್ಲೋರಿಸ್ ಟು ದೇ ಸಂಬುದ ಬೋಟೀಸ್ ಅಗ್ಲೋರಿಸ್ ಟು ದೇ ಸಂಬುದ ಬೋಟೀಸ್ ಅಗ್ಲೋರಿಸ್ ಟು ದೇ ಸಂಬುದ ಬೋಟೀಸ್ ಅಗ್ಲೋರಿಸ್ ಟು ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಅಂಡ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಪರಂಗ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ thank you rukmini prabhu that was beautiful thank you everyone uh, welcome to the sunday lecture hosted by iskon st louis today we have the fortune of associating with her grace rukmini devi rukmini prabhu is a senior disciple of shila prabhupad and a leader within the community and i've personally attended several of her retreats and workshops and that's what got me inspired to call her to come give us some association here in St. Louis. So let me do a quick introduction for those of you who haven't heard of Rukmini Devi. Rukmini Devi first met the devotees in San Francisco in 1968. A few weeks later she traveled to Montreal, Canada with the six householder couples who were on their way to open the London Temple. She took initiation from Shila Prabhupada there. She served as a pujari in the Boston and New York temples until 1972. At these times, she was part of a group of artists who were sent by Shila Prabhupada to Mayapur to learn the art of putul, a Bengali doll making technique. Shila Prabhupada wanted these dioramas to be used to present Krishna consciousness in innovative ways. In 1974, she continued this work as part of a group in Los Angeles under the name The First American Theistic Exhibition. Multimedia exhibits were created in Los Angeles and Detroit temples. She served in the Colorado temples from 1986 until 1993, when she and her husband, Anuptama Prabhu, moved to Washington, D.C. to establish a national office for ISKCON communications. They're involved in outreach through interfaith dialogue. For 25 years, they also owned a business with three locations in the Washington DC metro area as kinder spirits, which helped to fund various ISKCON and other social welfare projects. Since closing their business in 2017, Rukmini Devi has been teaching, leading workshops and retreats. She's on the board of directors of Bhakti Center in New York City, as well as Iskon Saba International Advisory Board. She's the founder of the Urban Devi Collective, which hosts a website and a woman's sangha each month at Bhakti Center. 
the Kirtan artist Gauravani is her son. She has three grandchildren, Revati, Kerava, and Kirtan Simha. We're so fortunate to have Rukmini Devi present with us today. She'll be speaking to us on the topic on what is love, which fits perfectly since you know today's Valentine's Day. Um, before handing it over to her, let, uh, just I wanted to let you guys know, let everyone know that feel free to turn on your videos, but please be on mute so we can hear Rukmini Devi speak clearly, and then we'll take questions at the end. So without any further ado, let me hand it over. We're so fortunate. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you, all my friends. Thank you for being here. Hello, Audrey and Andrea. And hello, Tara. And uh, thank you for being here. My friend Shravani, or my very dear friend from many, many years ago from my childhood, practically. So thank you all for being here. Let me just say a few prayers, OK? Om Agyana Timirandasya Yananjana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shi Gurave Namaha Shi Chetanamano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Sayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Sapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Sarasate Deve Goravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Paschatya Deshatarine Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangolangayate Girim Yakipastamam Bande Shigurun Dinatadanam Pancha kapata rubyascha kripa shindu bhaevacha patitanam pavanebhyo vaishnavebhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. So thank you all so much for being here. Today is Valentine's Day, so I thought it would be good to talk about what is love and maybe what is not love and who am I to be even capable of love? Um, is love only for, for God, for Krishna and nobody else? And is love for Krishna an exclusive type of love that's only for him? Or is it, can it be inclusive as well? Um, is there any love in this material world? Um, these are some of the things that I'd like to kind of discuss and unpack a little bit. So first of all, I wanted to start with this, this uh, quote that's quite interesting. Maybe you've heard it before, I'm not sure, but Sanskrit, the Sanskrit language has 96 words for love. Ancient Persian has 80. Greek has three. And English, only one. This is indicative of the poverty of awareness or emphasis that we give to that tremendously important realm of feeling. Here's an interesting thing, an interesting factoid. Eskimos have 30 words for snow because it is a life and death matter to them to have exact information about the element they live with so intimately. Just imagine if we had a vocabulary of 30 words for love, we would immediately be, be richer and more intelligent in this human element so close to our heart. An Eskimo would probably die of clumsiness if he had only one word for snow. We are close to dying of loneliness because we have only one word for love. Of all the Western languages, English may be the most lacking when it comes to feeling. Isn't that interesting? This is from someone named Robert Johnson. So yeah, the English language is a bit clumsy, right? When it attempts to talk about love. Um, I love my old slippers. I might love football, 
or maybe I love shopping. But just imagine, you know, if we could express love with more wisdom, with more knowledge of, of that uh, beautiful uh, expression of our hearts. So I was thinking that sometimes it's actually easier to recognize what is not love. Sometimes we might be at a wedding. You've probably been at a wedding before and you've heard um, these familiar words spoken about love from, from St. Paul in the biblical liter literature, Paul's letter to, letters to the Corinthians. So he says these, these words I find very, very beautiful and profound. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs, right? It's not, not keeping score all the time, right? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So these are some I think some of the greatest words ever spoken about love in the Western world anyway. So, so what is love? It's, it's not about getting what we want, right? It's, uh, you know, a child might be thinking that this world is all about me and, and uh, what's mine, right? That's, um, you know, they talk about delayed gratification as a symptom of being an adult, right? So in bhakti, we learn about growing up to a spirit of giving, serving, and love and service, devotional service. Love is a verb, it's an action, and it's about giving and, and not thinking about what I'm going to get in return. It's kind of a, I would say it's a maturing of love in giving, right? Bhakti is love in giving. And, and Srila Prabhupada's really beautiful preface to Nectar of Devotion. He talks about our natural propensity to love and how the basic principle of, the, of our, our living condition, condition is this propensity to love someone. And he, and he mentions that no one can live without loving someone else and how this, this is present in every living being. He even talks about tigers, how even a a violent creature like a tiger has that loving propensity in a, in a kind of a dormant stage. Or sometimes you see them, maybe the mama tiger wrestling around with the baby tigers or something like that. So he says that the, the missing point is where should we repose our love so that everyone can become happy? Um, and he says that our loving propensity remains uh, imperfectly fulfilled, unfulfilled, until we know, until we realize who is the Supreme Beloved. So he says, love, our love can only be satisfied when it is reposed or when it comes to find the shelter of Krishna. So then he gives a really beautiful image that I think is, is, um, is one of the most beautiful things in Srila Prabhupada's writings. He says that our loving propensity expands like a vibration of light or air might expand. Isn't that a beautiful image? And we don't really know where does it end. It just keeps expanding, expanding, expanding until um, perhaps until we meet Krishna face to face, right? Um, does, it, does it end when we meet Krishna or does it really begin? at that pl place when, we, when we, we meet and see the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Um, so yeah, can we even really conceive of what, what love truly is? So then he continues a little bit. He says, nectar of devotion teaches the science of loving every one of the living entities perfectly by the easy method of loving Krishna. So, I want to make this point that I think is very important that this bhakti love is inclusive because why? Because every living being is a part of Krishna. And by learning to love Krishna, we can experience the interconnectivity of us all, of the earth, of all living beings, of all existence. 
So bhakti love is inclusive love. So just if you could visualize, imagine that you're sitting on the bank of a still pond and you throw a pebble right into the center of the pond. So then so many concentric circles will radiate out from that center in harmony, right? Um, when we see Krishna, our source, um, as the center and the, um, you know, really by any name, right? God by any names, uh, see him as the source of all existence and throw that pebble of our consciousness into that center, right? But if I may mistake myself, if I am operating in my life as though I am the center and you, Ridhi, are operating as though you're the center and Shravani is operating as though she's the center, then they're all going to be all these um, clashing patterns coming out from each of these false centers, right? There'll be discord and conflict and these ripples generating out will be clashing so much. So I think the really counter counterintuitive piece of all this is that the more we selflessly offer our love to Krishna, to that center of all existence, the more we can taste and experience love ourselves, the more we experience harmony. So I think that by, by having it be all about me, I'm going to find satisfaction, but it doesn't work like that because that's an, an aberration in the way things really are, right? So imagine these pebbles and this still pond, these harmonious circles, whew, circles of love. And then we have circles of community generating out from that center of love when, when we take our, our big egos out of the center. So it sounds kind of easy, right? But, but we so often fail at love. Maybe you've experienced that. I know I've experienced it in my life so many times. So I wanted to share a story with you. Uh, my husband Anutama and I are involved in interfaith dialogue. And um, we've been, we have a dialogue that's gone on for over 25 years in Washington. And for the last maybe seven or eight years, we've had one in India. So these dialogues are, um, the people who take part in these dialogues are scholars and practitioners, scholars slash practitioners. And so on the Vaishnav side, we have, we have some Gaudi Vaishnavs and some Sri Vaishnavas, some Iskand Sanyasis. And on the Christian side, they'll there are Catholics and Protestants, and there's an archbishop and um, some professors, some priests, and some authors of published authors as well. So the way we do this is every year we, we choose a topic, and then someone writes a paper from the Christian side and from the Vaishnav side, usually Protestant paper, Catholic paper, Sri Vaishnav paper, um, Gaudi Vaishnav paper. So one year after the papers were presented, one of the Christian participants said, um, he said, it was very, I found it very authentic and vulnerable what he said. He said, you know, we Christians, we talk a lot about love of God, but you Vaishnavas have so many details of rasa and, and uh, so many de details about how to love God. And that was very beautiful of him to say that. But then one of the Vaishnavas said something that I think um, was equally beautiful or perhaps more beautiful. He said, yes, that's true. We do have um, so many details about love in our tradition, but we have to really learn from you Christians how to love our brother man. That's what we have to learn from you. So this was a beautiful meeting, I think, in love of, it was an authentic exchange of, of people from both sides um, being more vulnerable and and showing how love is about opening the heart to become less proud, less defensive, and more, yeah, more vulnerable and authentic. So I'm also reminded, we all know the beautiful story. Tara, you tell me if you know this story, maybe your mom told you this story of the fruit seller. This lady came to Krishna's house when he was a baby and she had a whole basket of fruits and she came and baby Krishna had seen his mom and he had seen the adults barter. So he picked up some grains in his little chubby fat baby hand and he ran to this fruit seller with his little grains and he was running so fast and he was so little, maybe two or three. 
And all these grains are just falling out of his hand. So by the time he got to this lady fruit seller, there was hardly any, hardly any grains in his hand at all. But she was so charmed by the vision of this beautiful baby Krishna that she, she just filled up his little chubby hands with as many fruits as he could carry. And she was so charmed that she didn't even notice that in her basket, all of the remaining fruits had turned to jewels. She didn't notice that at all until she got home because she wasn't keeping score, right? She just, she just wanted to give to Krishna so selflessly and she was so charmed by his beauty. So this is love. This is pure bhakti. This is who we, who we are. And if we don't live like this, if we don't love like this, then we haven't really begun the path of of bhakti, the path of loving devotional service. So yeah, I'm talking to myself also, you know, we all need to begin and move toward this loving devotional service. So Srila Prabhupada coined this term, Krishna consciousness from a verse, Krishna bhakti rasa bhavita mati, kriyatam yadi kutopi labhyate, tatra lalyam api mulam ekalam, Janmakoti Sukritai Nalapyate. And so what the verse says is that, uh, and this term Krishna consciousness comes from bhakti rasa bhava. It means uh, to be absorbed in the mellows of the rasas of executing loving devotional service to Krishna. So what the verse says basically is that we can only purchase bhakti by our eagerness to have it, by our greed to have it. So uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing that, that um, bhakti can never be purchased, but only by someone who is eager to, ha to have it. There's a story about Srila Prabhupada. Once a disciple asked, it was actually Vishnu Jan Swami, this beautiful, beautiful devotee. And he asked Srila Prabhupada, how can we render perfect service to Krishna? And Prabhupada said, by your eagerness, by your anxiety, by your anxiety. So how beautiful, right? That when we want it so bad, then Krishna will, will help us and give us the understanding how we can come to him. There's another nice verse that talks about love that says that just as the minds of young men are attracted to young girls and the minds of young girls are attracted to young men. Let my mind, the devotee says, let my mind sp sp spontaneously take pleasure in you, Krishna. So to me, this brings up a question that I wanted to ask that, is there any love in the material world? In, in, is this bhakti exclusive to Krishna or is it inclusive as well? Um, so sometimes we hear Srila Prabhupada say, you can listen to lectures and listen to many, many different conversations of Srila Prabhupada, but you have to understand what he says in the context of everything that he says, not to just pull something out and think, oh, that's the whole conclusion of everything because he speaks in many nuanced ways and he speaks in different ways. But I wanna tell you a little story that I find really sweet. So Srila Prabhupada was at New Vrindavan and he was just sitting speaking with some devotees on the grass, a little group of devotees. And right in front of him, there were these two baby kittens and they were just playing with each other and wrestling each other. And uh, right in front of them, they were kind of rolling around, rolling around, like just playing with each other. And Prabhupada was kind of laughing, looking at them. And then he said, you see, there is love in this material world, which was so shocking for everybody because everyone is always hearing Prabhupada say, there is no pleasure, there's no love in this material world, right? So, but then he explained it in such a profound and beautiful way that um, there is love, but it's just like in a desert, if there are a few drops of water, those few drops of water in a, in a parched desert, um, are, are just not enough to quench our unquenchable thirst. So I think that's a, it's a sanguine point. It's an important point that, um, yeah, in the desert of our hearts, 
Uh, we need an oasis. We need a reservoir to quench our thirst. And Krishna is called, actually the very first line of the Sanskrit nectar of devotion, Krishna is called uh, Akila Rasamrita Murti. And Srila Prabhupada translates this as Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure. So yeah, in a desert, right? A few drops of water are just not going to suffice and can't satisfy our deepest thirst. We need to find an oasis. We need to find a reservoir. We need to find an ocean of bhakti rasa, these sweet tastes, these mellows of devotion for which we're always anxious, for which we're longing, for which we're yearning for, right? And as spiritual beings, we actually come from a higher place beyond this desert and beyond this world. There's a beautiful quote from the great Christian teacher, C.S. Lewis, and he says, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, then the only logical um, explanation is that I was made for another world. So yeah, so in this world, in our human relationships of, of love between two people, um, sometimes we experience a lot of pain in love in this world. And maybe you've experienced before, or maybe you've known someone who's experienced before, when you're in a relationship or two people are in a relationship, and then someone else comes along and drives a wedge in that relationship. It's a really, really painful situation. And it's called a love triangle, a love triangle. It's a painful um, situation that comes in this world. But you know how Bhagavad Gita describes that, that uh, there's a banyan tree on a, on a reservoir of water and it's reflected upside down in the water. So things in this world tend to be upside down, right? But so I want to make the point that in spiritual life, the idea of a love triangle is really a good idea. And why do I say that? Because if you're in a relationship with someone in love, you know, it could be a, a child or a partner or, or a friend. If you can bring into that relationship some Krishna, it becomes a love triangle in the most beautiful and holistic and satisfying way. So I highly recommend this idea that if you're looking for a love relationship of any sort, try to bring in that love triangle concept and, and bring Krishna in, sharing some Krishna. And what happens is you can go deeper in the relationship. Your relationship will flourish. You can uh, feel more satisfied seeing, helping, helping people see Krishna in their journeys and um, seeing Krishna in others, seeing the connect, connectivity, the interconnectivity between all of us. So yeah, and Krishna talks in the Bhagavad Gita about seeing Krishna in the taste of water, in the light of the sun, the moon, the ability in others. So this, this is a bhakti vision that I, I consider very transformative and, um, and not exclusive, but inclusive, right? Because it includes the earth, it includes all living beings, it includes everyone, we, everyone who exists, the animals, the earth, because they are, are all part of Krishna by their intrinsic nature, right? And what happens is when we think like this, when we can have this kind of transformative vision in our hearts, then what happens is it, it actually starts to turn matter into spirit and it turns iron into gold. Because the fact is that um, according to the um, bhakti philosophy, nothing is in, a, in and of itself matter or material, but it's just this kind of veneer that we put over it of trying to enjoy it separately from Krishna. Otherwise it is spiritual. This world is spiritual. Um, but it is temporary. So it's not an illusion. The bhakti tradition doesn't call this world illusion, this world of relationships, this world of forms. It's not illusion, but it is temporary. And we can connect it to Krishna by this transformative vision. 
of seeing Krishna's connection everywhere. So this is the beginning of bhakti, I would say, to have this kind of appreciative love, um, have some appreciation for the gifts we receive each day, um, so many unseen gifts, some we see, but so many we don't see. Um, today, I was given another breath of life. I, I didn't deserve it. I wasn't entitled to it. But again, I was given this day to, to try to practice a little bit more, to, to try to try again. So thank you so much, Krishna, for, for this day that I've, I received by your, by your grace. And, um, and without this kind of appreciative gratitude, then we're talking about love here, right? So this is the beginning of love. And without this appreciative gratitude, love is actually impossible. We can't go to the place of love without these baby steps or beginning steps of this appreciative gratitude. Sometimes it's said that appreciative gratitude is the lobby to the palace of bhakti, and there is no back door. So that's something powerful and beautiful to meditate on. So what is love? We talked a little bit about what love is not, a little bit about appreciative love. It's what each one of us is really seeking, right? To love and be loved for who we are, for who we really are, without the masks and without the game playing. You know, people play so many games and, you know, ego games and, and all kinds of jogging for position or superiority in different places. So love is without these games and without these masks. The poet Virgil says, love conquers all, and therefore we too should be conquered by love. So how can we come to this place of being conquered by love? What would it mean to be conquered by love? So there's a place in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, if you want to look it up, it's the first canto, second chapter, and the sixth verse. It actually um, defines love. And if we could understand this verse, I would say that it would, it would change the whole trajectory of our lives and change the whole trajectory of our thinking. So this verse, I'll say it in Sanskrit for you. It says, Savai punsam paro dharma yato bhakti arhoksije ahaitiki apritiyata yaya atma supersediti. So the verse says that the highest love is love in action, that love is a verb, and that the only love that can really truly fully satisfy ourselves is loving devotional service that's not interrupted and that is, doesn't have any ulterior motive or any false motivation or selfish motivation. So this is a really a high, high, high pinnacle to come to, but it's, it's, it's good to have um, an ideal in our hearts to know uh, what the real essence is and, and where, I need to, where I need to try to come, try to climb to, try to receive in my chanting and in my service. So yeah uninterrupted and unmotivated by false motivations. So these, these uh, rasas are sweet tastes of relationships in service. In the purport of this verse, Srila Prabhupada calls the relationship of, of the servant and the served, this exchange of love. It's like, kind of like, you know, the process of kirtan. It's like a call and a response, the call and the response. So this beautiful exchange of love between that supreme person who is served in devotional service and, and those who serve, um, Prabhupada calls that exchange the most congenial form of intimacy. It's such a beautiful phrase, the most congenial form of intimacy. And he says that um, this intimacy becomes revealed in time as our devotional service progresses. So maybe I don't know what that means right now in my you know, present stage of devotional service, but I can aspire for that in simplicity to just offer my whole heart 
when I offer that little flower or when I cook a little pot of kitri for my family or whatever I may be doing, teaching a yoga class, teaching a Gita class. When I do that um, as an offering to Krishna, then it becomes, it can grow into this beautiful, most congenial form of intimacy. So Sri Krishna, Lord Sri Krishna is the central pivot of all things, of all existence, right? He's the, um, the, the source of all living beings. He's the supreme living being and he's the all attractive eternal form among all living beings and among all other forms. And we also each have our form, eternal form in spiritual existence. And Krishna is the eternal attraction for each and every one of us. He's the most attractive person. He's a complete whole and everything else is his part and parcel. So when we can live seeing this interconnectivity between us all as spiritual beings and seeing each one of us connected to that source of Krishna, then it connects us in this loving network and in um, what um, Dr. Martin Luther King called the beloved community. This is, I think, a vision of what our society needs to try to come to. And I think the process of bhakti, we have these gifts for the world, for, for our society, these beautiful healing gifts of what it would mean to live and serve in beloved community. And this is what I'm saying. This is the point I'm making, that this is the inclusive love that we learn on the path of bhakti, right? Um, yeah, we can begin to experience this love, this beginning of love, even now, by whatever we do, doing that as an offering. Yes, today I am stirring this pot of kitri for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. Today I am sweeping my floor. I am teaching my uh, IT program, project management IT class. I am doing this for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. If I offer a simple leaf, a flower, a little water, to do it in this mood of love and devotion, and then Krishna says he accepts it. So this is this con congenial form of intimacy that we can begin to experience. These very, very simple offerings of the heart gradually give us just a tiny clue to what our actual life is, to what it means to actually love. Again, looking at Audrey, she has a beautiful pastry business in, in Vancouver. She's a master pastry chef. And she has a thriving business. So she does this as an offering to Krishna. All of these beautiful pastries are offered to Krishna with love and devotion. And so many people benefit. So whatever it is we're doing, whatever our gifts are, they're meant to be offered to God. Because if, if, they, if they're not offered to God, then they will destroy us, right? They're given to us by God. And whatever we give back to God, that's our gift back to him. And Srila Prabhupada gives a really beautiful example that I love. He says, when a woman decorates her face by putting makeup on her face, her, the reflection in the mirror also gets decorated. So the face is getting decorated and the reflection is getting decorated too. So we are actually reflections of Krishna. And when we try to please him, we also become pleased because we're part of him. So to offer our love to him, um, to his servants, to share his love with his beloved parts, and to become his agents of love in the world. These are precious gifts of love. These are the fruits and flowers of love, the rasas of bhakti that can be tasted and shared by, between ourselves and others on the path. In this way, it becomes a beautiful, beloved community of love. So this is the kind of love that's beyond the pale of our jaded experience that we have of love in, in material existence. Ramanuja Acharya said something really beautiful. He said that joy, he said that love is the same thing as joy. Why? Because Krishna is rasa. He's the personification of rasa. He is akila rasamrita murti, the reservoir of all pleasure. And when we realize a little, even just a little, little taste of Krishna, then we become joyful. So love equals joy. 
if we're not feeling that joy, we have to go back and think, where did I forget to be appreciative, to be grateful? Where did I forget to pour my heart into this simple offering, um, into just loving Krishna in a simple, sincere way? Yeah. So, you know, I was thinking that to talk about love because today is Valentine's Day. And on Valentine's Day and practically every other day of the year, Cupid is, is um, he's just got his arrows pointing everywhere, right? And, um, but our eternal beloved person, our source of all existence is Lord Sri Krishna, who is the Kamadev, the Supreme Kamadev, the transcendental Cupid and the all attractive person. So we can pray to Krishna to shoot, to shoot his five arrows of attraction into our hearts, his arrow of beauty, his arrow of the fragrance of his body, the arrow of his voice, the arrow of his touch, the arrow of his of a taste of nectar, right? And what happens is when a devotee finally meets Krishna, then all of these beautiful qualities come together and overwhelm the devotee. And, um, and they all join together in the arrow of Krishna's beautiful compassion and the devotee becomes overwhelmed and his spiritual senses awaken. So this is something that we have to look forward to on the path of bhakti. Where does this beam of light, where does this beam of air, where will it end? It just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. And we don't know where it will end. So, yeah, we can also pray to Krishna to be his instrument, to be like his arrow, to carry forward his, his holy name, his instructions, his merciful sweetness to the people we meet in our lives and to, and to come to really truly know ourselves. What is love? So. Thank you all so much. And I want to see if any of you have any, um, anything that was important for you here. Um, any takeaways or reflections or any questions that you'd like to put about love? What is love? What is not love? How can we access love? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rukmini Devi, Rukmini Prabhu. Uh, so there's two ways you can ask questions. I mean, there's, feel free to unmute and ask questions. And if you'd like and are shy or uncomfortable, feel to put them in the chat and I can read them out. Okay. So Audrey is asking, I see something in the chat. Yeah. Which verse, that verse, Savai Pumsam Paro Dharma. It's really the verse that defines love and it's, First canto, second chapter, sixth verse. She's got it now. Yeah, I found it. Thank you. Is that okay to interact now just for... Yes, yeah. I remember you sharing that verse um, during one of your uh, Krishna book sanghas on Patreon. And yeah, I got to say that since then, now I'm glad that you talked about it again so I can screenshot it and keep it, like save it in my phone for an easy access. Not that I give me a second but yeah, I think what, what I always take away when you speak about love in that verse is that if it's not unmotivated or uninterrupted, meaning like if there is a personal motivation behind or if it can be interrupted for any reasons, then it's not true love. And whether like it applies in back to your Krishna consciousness or even everyday life, there is a lot of people that kind of take away their love to punish someone but if somebody does that then they are just giving you proof that their love wasn't pure to begin with right so it's always what i go to now yeah when I have to doubt. that's a really beautiful question thank you so much and yeah you know we're beginners on the path so we're just taking baby steps and we're just trying but it's good to know what the ideal of love is so that we know that it's not just that, hey, there is no love anywhere. You know, I'm just floundering around in this world and there really is no, 
love anywhere. What is that? That's kind of like ex existentialism, you know? There's no love anywhere, and we might as well just all forget about it. So to know that somewhere that love exists, somewhere that beautiful fruit seller, she was an Aborigine woman, actually, in that story. She's just a lady who lives in the forest, right? She's not educated. She doesn't have a degree. She's probably not that beautiful and um, certainly not wealthy, right? But she's got this pure love. So I think in so many of the, because Srimad Bhagavatam really is a, it's a conversation within a conversation within a conversation. So in all these relationships, we have Bhagavad Gita, Krishna and Arjuna, but in all these conversations, we have so many pinnacles of love. We have so many people who teach us what is love, you know, how to, how to overcome the obstacles to love, you know, how to become awakened. Like the story of Narada Muni in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, he's talking about how all his senses became awakened. You know, when he's going through this process of realization, all his senses become awakened with love. So I think these are, you know, so they're sort of like points of light in the sky for us to see. Not that we should be beating ourselves up that I didn't perform pure, perfect, uninterrupted devotional service back to the corner today. No, you know, we should be encouraged that it is possible for each one of us. And it's not based on anything external. It's not based on power or our wealth or beauty or, or high intellectual education. It's just based on that one sincere ability to offer my little flower. And maybe today I didn't do it so lovingly, but, but again, I have my chance tomorrow, right? To again, offer my flower. And I think in some ways this is, sometimes I see this as the difference between, you know, Shravaniya, you live in Hong Kong. So sometimes this is the difference between the ancient East. Of course, right now, Hong Kong is a very modern city and a very fast city, just like West, cities in the West. But perhaps this is the difference between the ancient East and the modern West, which is everywhere. I mean, because of the internet, the West, Western culture is everywhere. But we want it fast and we want it now. And sometimes if we don't get it fast and now and right away, wham, bam, you know, we think, oh, well, it probably doesn't exist or I certainly couldn't attain it. But we have so many examples of those who do, you know, in all circumstances. So I think that I find that hopeful. I find that hopeful that to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And, um, you know, tomorrow, this croissant, did I pronounce it terribly? Yeah, croissant, I can't speak French. Tomorrow, this croissant will be offered with a little bit more love than the one I offered today. Just gradually, gradually, just putting one, one foot in front of the other. So do you find that a little bit hopeful and helpful? Yeah, Tara does, so thank you. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Rukmini Prabhu. I just have a quick, <laughs> a quick question. I really um, loved the uh, visual that you gave about um, the, the love triangle and that the only satisfying one can be with Krishna as the third person. Really, really loved that. I'm just <laughs> wondering, how do we incorporate that uh, with um, the idea that I, we're trying to uh, balance knowing that it's Krishna with Radha, like that balancing energy of the two of them, how do we incorporate that as well? Just because mm -hmm. I, I'm always thinking of how do we put in Radha? <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you for that. Well, Radha is always a part of Krishna. So then we can't really say that that would be four because she is intrinsically Krishna and Krishna is intrinsically her. You know, um, Krishna doesn't exist without Radha. Radha doesn't exist. Even, even in the holy name we chant, right? We have two pairs of names where they're in union. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And then in separation, Krishna, Krishna. He's longing for Radha. Hare, Hare, she's longing for him. So um, they're always there together. And thank you for bringing her up. Because, you know, in one place, there's a beautiful book called the, um, what's it called? 
the, I forget the name of it actually, but it's a little bitty book by Viswanath Chakravarti Thakur. And he talks about how Radha and Krishna are just like, um, they're like two candles that have come from one stem. Like if you have two wicks that have come from one little wick or two flowers, sometimes you see two little roses um, blooming from one stem, right? Or sometimes I like to give the example like a garbanzo bean, you know, it's one, but you can pop it in half, it's actually two. So this is the beautiful union of Radha and Krishna. And just like the way their love is always in balance and they're always enhancing and increasing their love between each other. So keeping Krishna in that love triangle, I think in our relationships is really about balancing because you know, sometimes someone that we're in partnership with in our life, you know, doesn't want as much Krishna as we want in our life. And, and maybe doesn't want every single word in our conversations to be about Krishna. And so we have to be able to honor the differences in those relationships and honor, honor the voices, honor, honor those who are listening, you know, because what, look, at, look at our lives, you know, we, ha we may have little ones, we may have teenagers, we may have a partner who's, you know, just not all so much into this stuff as we are. Or we may have friends that we're trying to help along the path in, in sensitive ways and not overwhelm them with, you know, you, know you, you have to, boom, you have to be doing this and this and this. Sometimes when people come to one of our temples, they get overwhelmed, right? Because everyone's saying, don't do this and don't do this and don't stick out your feet and don't sit like that. And, and so they just want to run away, right? So it, it really, I think in re love means to be sensitive in relationships, to be caring and really hearing the other person. Really love means to, to listen, right? Um, it, it, it means having... We sent out this beautiful thing the other day. So a heart is like two ears like that. So there are these two ears on either side of our head. And in, in the word heart, there's it's separated in the middle of the word heart is the word ear. So we have two ears and we have one mouth. And to open our hearts, we have to be listening more and not, not uh not preaching so much really, but hearing and what are the needs and what are the interests, what are the concerns of, of whoever I'm sharing with. That's putting ourselves aside and our own egos aside and being able to truly share in ways that will really be able to be received because Krishna consciousness is, it's, um, it's caught more than it's taught. Sometimes that's, have you ever heard that before? It's caught more than it's taught. So we may, you know, Actually, there's one lecture where Prabhupada is saying very beautifully, he says, we are hearing so much, preach, 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 but they do not know. They must be empowered to preach. So when we're teaching, we prefer these days, we prefer the word teaching, not preaching. But when we're teaching, we have to really be thinking of how, how is it being heard? How is it being received? And with sensitivity, sharing that Krishna in that love triangle. So it's not like a big gigantic Krishna, the size of the universal form and pushing my partner out to the side and pushing, no. The little Krishna can just come in, you know, very sweetly, like a little baby Krishna. <laughs> I hope that's a little bit helpful. Hare Bol. Hare Bol. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Linda was pronounced dear Rukmini Ma. My dear friend, Sadhana. Um, I, and um, I have a question uh, regarding the, you know, we always say that Krishna is the enjoyer and all the jiva souls are the enjoyed. Um, and that nomenclature is, is lovely, but also it sort of strikes in my mind that, you know, if I do love Krishna that much, that I will actually enjoy <laughs> And we're not supposed to enjoy the object of our senses, right? And we're talking about love today. So I was just trying to see how that paralleled, you know, and mm -hmm. where that went. And mm -hmm. um, so that was where I was going. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a beautiful question. The fact is that 
in the exchanges we see between Krishna and his devotees, he experiences that he is not enjoying as much as his devotees are enjoying. He sees that Radharani is enjoying more than he is, and the gopis are enjoying more than he is. So therefore he comes as Lord Chaitanya in order to taste what, what it is his bhaktas are tasting. And he becomes just like a, it's so funny, you know, we think of the term enjoyer, the supreme enjoyer, like he's the king of the castle and we're just all these little underlings underneath. But what does Lord Chaitanya teach? He teaches this sort of inversion, like king of the castle, right? The humans are at the top or maybe there's a big fat God on the top and all the humans acting like, oh, I am the steward of the earth, right? And then all the animals and the earth and everything's down below. But Lord Chaitanya actually inverts that pyramid and he puts the earth and the animals, the trees and the grass at the top, right? And, and as human beings, we have to serve or, or we're, we're um, implored to serve as the servants of the servants of the servants. And in that way, we get the sweetest taste, which is also very, very counterintuitive because we think that if I'm in that position, I will be destroyed and I will never be able to experience and enjoy. But this is the place of the real enjoyment. And what happens is that Krishna, he becomes a prisoner in the heart of his devotees who are so selflessly loving in this way. Um, and it's so beautiful to me because it's beyond money. It's beyond beauty. It's beyond affluence. It's beyond education. It's just you know, this, this sweetness, like, uh, you know, the, the thing that's coming to mind for me right now is this story of when Duryodhana uh, invited Krishna to come for lunch and he had the whole spread of, you know, he had the best sh chefs in the kingdom and he had a gigantic spread of every imaginable, you know, delicacy. And Krishna just walked right by his house, right? And he, w where did he go? He walked to the house of Vidura, who wasn't even home. And his wife was there, except she was in the shower. And so she just threw on something really quick. And she was in so much ecstasy. All she had in the house was bananas. And so she's peeling the bananas. You know the story. She's throwing the bananas away and giving Krishna the peels. And in great joy, because Krishna is joy. Love is joy. Krishna is eating the banana peels. So what does it mean? It means that he is a prisoner in the heart of the devotee that the devotee is, um, is enjoying so much more than Krishna. And Krishna has to study what is, what is the greatness of, of this love of a devotee? What is the greatness of Radharani's love? What's the pleasure she feels through her love? And what, you know, what's the happiness? What are the qualities in him that she relishes through her love? So he has to actually come and, and live as a devotee in, covered by the complexion of Radharani and covered by the mood of Radharani. So it's very, very mystical and very beautiful, I think. But this is bhakti. And other, other processes of, of attainment, other process of the, processes of yoga are more you know, achievement-oriented and more perfection-oriented. But bhakti is about coming to this place of, of, um, of humility and love where there's the greatest reciprocation. And it's so... I mean, I think it's so mystical, actually, because it's so endearing to the heart. I mean, you know, sometimes people say, well, yeah, you know, that's great in the temple, but how do I practice that in my office? I know, you, you know, you work in the field of IT, right? Yeah, so, you know, but it does actually work in the office, because if, you, if we exhibit those bhakti qualities, like not trying to push myself forward, but show those qualities of bhakti, it becomes so endearing the people's defenses just melt away and people, their hearts open and they, they, be, they become able to love and able to trust by those qualities. You know, one thing that comes to mind for me is we had a business at one time in, in the airport in, in Denver, Colorado, and there was this um, cleaning lady. She was cleaning the bathrooms. That was her job. She was cleaning the bathrooms but her heart was so loving and so giving 
that the, the big executives who were making six figure incomes at that time would come to her for advice on their marriages or their relationships or the problems of their lives. So it is a very, it's counterintuitive, it's very mystical, but I think it's very profound. And in this way, the humble devotee is enjoying more than Krishna. And Krishna has to study the character. And the great Uddhava, the great disciple of Brihaspati, right? He has to come down from his high horse of education and study what these simple gopis are experiencing in their love. So this is bhakti. This is the mystery of bhakti. I hope that's a little bit helpful. Very nice. Thank you so much for your sweet. It's, it's so good to see you. So good to see you after a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Rukmini. Hi. Who's that, Robert? Yes. Robert, I, I hear you. Can you see me? No, I can see you, but I will look for you. Let's see. Let's see. There he is. I see his hands. And Hello, I, Robert. And Shamala Priya also here. Wow, there's a threesome. You have a love triangle. <laughs> there they are. A love triangle. <laughs> it's nice to see you. I wanted to share a small story with you uh, based on, you, you had mentioned love being the verb. May I do that? Please. So there was a teacher, his name was Stephen Covey. And mm, he, great teacher. Uh, he has a very similar story that had a big impact on me when I first heard it. And he told the story about a man came to him looking for counsel and he was telling Stephen, Stephen, I, I don't love my, after 20 years, I don't love my wife any longer. And I, I don't know what to do. What, what should I do? And, and, and Covey said, love her. He said, no, 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 I, I, don't, I don't love her. I, I just not, you know, I just don't have interest. I don't love her anymore. What should I do? He said, love <laughs> her. And then finally he said, I don't have the feeling. And Stephen Covey said, love, the feeling is a result of love, the action. Whoa, beautiful. And it's very empowering also because if we are only dependent upon our feelings for how we, how, we, uh, you know, how we love, if we're dependent on just feelings, then it's gonna be very variable and not constant. It's also outside of our control. Yet if we're living in the mode of uh, giving and service, uh, then we have full control over that uh, activity. Right. And so, in the spirit of Valentine's Day, I will use my own dear wife as an example in this case. One thing that we do is that we are in constant and total service to one another. <laughs> Catch, we're, we trip over ourselves serving each other in the smallest and largest ways. And mm -hmm. in, that act, in that action, we actually get joy ourselves. I am so happy to serve her and she feels the same way. And this is really the idea of service with Krishna in the center. And so love the action is definitely a, is definitely a, 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 contrib a contributor to love the feeling. Thank you. That's so important, isn't it? So important. Yeah, because I think as Western people, we think that this feeling of love is going to come and sweep over me, that Cupid is going to come and shoot me with his arrow and boom, I'm going to feel love. But, you know, all these fairy tales that, that end with, and they all lived happily ever after, that's where the story actually begins, right? Because that's where the work of love begins. That's where the, you know, what does that one Buddhist teacher say? Uh, you know, do the laundry and uh, what is it? Carry water, do laundry, you know? So this is, this is real love in action. And I think bhakti is so pragmatic, really. It's beautiful because it's idealistic, but it's also so pragmatic. And, and yes, it does really work in the office. You can take it to the office. You know, you go get a cup of coffee for yourself in the office and you get one for, you know, the person in the other cubicle or whatever. You know, you see that someone has a need and it's, this is bhakti, random acts of kindness. How can I serve? And, and by going to that place of service, we become gratified. We become blessed. Because these are Krishna's parts and parcels. There's this one place in the Chaitanya Bhagavat where Lord Chaitanya says, every one of the innumerable living beings are my beloved parts and parcels. And if anyone causes harm to any one of them, 
I'm not even going to tell you what he says. He just says, forget it, you know, just don't even try it. So just understand that if you want to serve Krishna, you have to serve all living beings. And yes, it is. It's beautiful in a sense, because in a sense, there is an exclusivity of loving Krishna because he is his own wonderfulness, right? He is the Supreme Personality, the most attractive person. So there is an exclusive love, but it's also inclusive. So again, it's, it's very mystical. It's inclusive, but it's exclusive at the same time. You know, there's only one Krishna, but yet every living being, the earth and every living being, they're all his parts and parcels. So loving Krishna by loving all living beings. Thank you. Love is a verb, the feeling. What was it? The feeling? We access the feeling by the action. Love, the feeling, is a result of love, the action. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. So if you don't love your wife anymore, just love her. And you'll see that feeling will start to awaken. Because that's the, that's the work of bhakti. Beautiful. Thank you. So important for all of us. You know? Yeah, I, I heard uh, someone speaking the other day. Um, if you don't like what you've got if you if you don't get what you like then like what you've got right if you don't uh get what you like like what you've got and this is a, this is going to the place of appreciative love that we were talking about what else let's see this sorry this is argentina oh is there somebody else speaking no please go ahead <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, You're so I, in the dark. Can you put, is there a light? I'm in the dark oh. because I have to keep the light low so I don't wake up. I had surgery, so I'm trying to stay. Okay, no problem. We can hear you. We can hear yeah. you just fine. Sorry about that. Um, no problem. I just had a, a situation, and as I'm listening to everyone, I'm getting a lot of my answers. But one thing I realized is um, I was with my niece uh, recently. She's about 12. And she's going through some very isolating issues. I believe she's dealing with a lot of abandonment, rejection, and, um, and, and being ignored. She locks herself in her bedroom. She never comes out except at 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. This is a 12-year-old child, and I've had concerns about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I took her out, and when we were out, she expressed to me, I, I had ordered a beverage for her, and she said, I don't like people. I don't want to be here. Mm. It was so, uh, I felt a tremendous amount of pressure for some reason because we were awaiting beverages being prepared. She needed to get out of this public store that had five people. Mm. I thought there's only five people here and she's with me. So I said, um, it's okay. No one's even, no one even knows we're here. I, I assume these four high school girls were in a, in a conversation that was distracting them from anything going around them and a man uh, probably in his fifties, just awaiting his beverage. When we walked outside, I saw her calm and um, we went to a makeup store and I began speaking to a woman and she said, don't talk to anybody. Mm. And boy, oh boy. And I said, what is happening here? She had a panic attack. Mm. I thought, oh no. And I thought, what am I going to do? And um, I just tried to speak to my sister about it because she lives with her. And it's the, it's the usual classic comment. Oh, she's going through a phase. This is what she does. And, you know, I'm thinking oh my, from where I'm coming from, this child needs love. She needs to be heard. Mm -hmm. She needs to be um, respected. And um, my sister does the antithesis. She reprimands her for eating ramen noodles and reprimanded me for buying them. Mm -hmm. I said, oh no. So I just realized in this moment that I should be detached from the expectation of loving her because I'm never going to know whether she's, I'm reaching her. I'm never going to, I'm never going to resolve this issue with my sister because my sister has her mind made up. This is it. That's it. I, I think you can, you can also pray to Krishna for yes. some opportunities, how you can, how you can access her heart. Because, you know, I mean, we're talking about giving people the gift of Krishna. 
but the most valuable, short of giving Krishna, the most valuable gift we can give another person is our attention. And she sounds like she's not getting the attention that she needs. And so this isolation is very, very dangerous. So whenever you get the chance to take her out of that environment and find out where, how to access her heart, how to help her feel heard and find something of interest to her. Maybe she would like to learn how to embroider or maybe she would learn, like to learn how to um, do something that she's never done before. Maybe, you know, maybe she doesn't swim or maybe there's something that could access her heart. Maybe she's never had a chance to do any creative work, some drawing or sketching or journaling. You know, maybe she has some poems inside her heart. Um, so I would not give up, and, but, but just pray to Krishna for his, his guidance on how to help her not be in that isolated place because isolation is very, very dangerous for all of us, every one of us. When you have a friend that's isolating, you know, we have to try to help them be heard and help them be seen. And even when Krishna shows up for us in his holy name, right? We, we want to receive him as a guest. We want him to feel heard, to feel seen. You know, Krishna, you've come to my house in your holy name, in your beautiful form, in your picture. And I want to receive you. I want you to feel seen and heard and appreciated. So every one of us needs that because we're all social beings. Even this, you know, I talk about social isolation, you know, really it should be, we should be saying physical distancing, not social distancing, because we really, really are social beings and we need to deeply have that connection in different ways. So help her to not be isolated and um, help and try to forgive your, your sister and see what has really pushed her to that, those kinds of attitudes, because maybe there's something unexpressed in her heart also. So I hope that's helpful. But, yes. Um, I would yes. say, you know, to a, a cure to destructive behaviors is, is something creative. You know, maybe get her some finger paints or some watercolors or, you know, she can sketch and colored pens, you know, those beautiful markers that, you know, you can add a little water and they just flow like watercolors. Do something like that that just might open up a whole new world for her. She um, is artist she does paint ah see that's, that's very very key piece of understanding because yeah creative energy when it when it turns in the other direction it becomes destructive so and that's that's there in all of us um do, is there time can i tell a little story i'm a little over time will you guys tolerate a little story um there's there's a beautiful story of a he was a a, 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 a a um, director of plays. And in New York, the critics completely panned this play that he directed. And they, and he thought his career was finished. His life was finished. And he was, you know, he had, he, he was just in a deep depression. He didn't know how he was going to even continue with his life. And he was just moping around the house, not knowing what to do and what he could, how he could get out of this huge slump. Um, and, uh, his little daughter came up to him and said, Daddy, could you paint my bicycle? It's looking really, really old. Do you think you could paint my bicycle? And so he started painting her bicycle and he just really got into it and he started painting stars and moons and all kinds of beautiful decorations on her bike. And then his other daughter said, oh, my bike doesn't look as good as that one. Could you paint my bike too? And then what happened, the kids in the neighborhood all started bringing their bikes to him to get their bikes to be spiffed up and, and beautiful the way those two bikes had been. And so what happened was he used his creative energy in a way that he never expected. And it got him out of his depression and out of his slump. So creative energy is, you know, it comes from Krishna. It's a gift and we have to use it. Otherwise it, it turns destructive. So that's a very, very key key piece that just came out that she, that she is an artist so help her to express that and and she will thank you 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 can be a um a, a complete catalyst and a huge change in her life i think that's true for all of us whatever abilities we have you know if we're writers or or whatever we do for uh, that inspires us 
Thank you, Rukmini. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. I think we're getting over time here, and I want to respect everyone's time. Um, let's see. Vidhi, are there any other burning questions that we need to address here? Yeah, maybe we can give one more question. Okay. If somebody has a burning burning desire to ask something, feel free. Okay. And uh, Riddhi has put something in the chat. If you'd all like to please follow me at um, Rukmini Walker at Facebook or urbandavy.com or patreon.com slash Rukmini Walker, please join with me, partner with me, and um, we can share more wonderful times together like this one. Yeah. Like no one's coming out, <laughs> scared them with the one question. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much for sharing this time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for spending Valentine's Day evening hearing about the Supreme Transcendental Cupid and how to be shot with his arrows of attraction. And thank you very, very much for inviting me, Riddhi. It was my honor to be here. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. We've learned so much today, and I'm sure all of us have learned a lot too. Um, I was going to share these pages that Rukmini Prabhu, you just brought up. There's her Facebook page. I'll just do a quick share so you guys can see. These, uh, there we go. Please follow her if you want to keep up to date on Rukmini Prabhu's um, what she's up to. This is a great page. I follow it as well. And there's the Urban Davy Collective. Here you can find interesting thought provoking articles. I subscribe to the newsletter. You can subscribe here. Find great articles to read. And finally, oh, would you like to say anything? No, thank you so much. Very <laughs> and finally, if you want to support her work, all this wonderful work she does of leading workshops and retreats and giving these talks, please go to this uh, Patreon page and you can subscribe to sub show her your support. Thank you all so much. My honor to be here. Thank you, Riddy, for organizing this. Thank you Thank all you. for joining. <laughs> it is our honor to have you with us today. Thank you. Uh, before we close, I'm going to ask uh, Ramacharya Prabhu, he usually organizes these talks, if he has any announcements or any, anything you would like to add. Are you there, Ramacharya Prabhu? Well, if not, <laughs> no, we can. Thank you. Oh. I just have a few words. Uh, thank you, Mataji, for coming and giving us your association. It's really very, very nice to, you know, have your association and I'm looking forward to have more of your talk here to our congregation. Thank you, Riddhi, for organizing it. Really appreciate your support. I saw Anutma Prabhu also in the beginning. So <laughs> thank you, Prabhu. I mean, he is uh, our GBC. So thank mm -hmm. you for coming and being part of this program. Thank you, everybody, for being part of the program once again. A lot of, you know, nice questions that came up and I was just, you know, hearing and learn a lot today. So thank you, Mataji, for your wonderful class today. And I'm looking forward to have more of your association. Dandot Panams, thank you. Thank you. Yes, please come visit us in St. Louis. Yes, sure. yes Mataji, please do that. <laughs> thank you so much. Dandot, we'll be approaching you, you know, through Riddhi. So maybe, you know, <laughs> some sort of seminar or something that you can do for us. we will love to have that. So thank we'll you. talk about Mataji's. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, Thank you all you. for being here. Hare Krishna. Good night. Yeah.